Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the first uh, Bento Society Roundtable. Today, we're going to be discussing the topic of what to measure and what not to measure. Uh, so why is this a subject even worth exploring? Why, why should we talk about what to measure and what not to measure? And what do I even mean by measurement in the first place? Um, so for the purpose of this conversation, I'm thinking when I'm saying measurement in data, I'm assuming um, data and measurement that tracks human activity at either a personal or population level. So, you know, I'm sure we'll get into other forms of measurement, you know, measuring water levels or resources or whatever, lots of things you can measure. My default assumption is that I'm, uh, is that we're speaking about human activity. You know, this is an interesting conversation because uh, the ability to track and measure human activity has never been easier than now. The digital age creates sensors that let us track our behavior. We can identify specific values. We can shift people's behavior. Um, and so we're flooded with data like never before. And as we'll get into, there's a high likelihood for a lot of bullshit, um, but also a lot of opportunity. And so this is also coinciding with a real low point for trust in regards to data. Uh, public trust and allowing governments or private companies to have our data is low. Uh, and yet any path that we can imagine the world fundamentally changing for the better is gonna involve data and measurement at the core of how that happens. The most important metrics of the 21st century might, have, might not have been made yet. How does this unfold? Where do we go from here? And that's what we're gonna dig into in this roundtable. Um, and even though this is one Zoom room, I want us to imagine that there are two different rings of this table. Um, so the inner ring are eight people uh, from among those people who RSVP, just organically RSVP'd, whose background and experience I thought was especially relevant to our conversation. And I thought they'd have a lot to add. So I contacted those people ahead of time and let them know. And so for the first hour, I'm gonna direct our five focus questions just to those people. Now we have five questions to go through. We're gonna spend about 10 minutes per question. Not everybody's gonna talk on every topic and we're gonna to try to keep a, a flowing conversation. If you start to talk a little long, I'll raise my hand and try to you know, decrescendo you and let someone else speak, but just, just wanna keep an open floor. And the outer ring is the other eight people in this room. And you are also experts with things to share and add, people with very intense curiosity or knowledge about these questions. And I'm asking you to be deep listeners for the first hour to add supplemental information and in chat uh, to help us, you know, sort of see what it is that we're talking about, maybe some connections we're not making. And then during the last half hour, we'll all open up and talk together. All right, so now I'm just gonna introduce this inner ring of people because it's good to know who's here. Hopefully they are all here, we'll, we'll find out. So first is Esther Dyson. Uh, Esther, you can wave. Uh, Esther is executive founder of Wellville, a 10-year, five-community nonprofit project devoted to helping communities sustain health for the long term for, quote, all of us in five U.S. communities. One of the challenges is how to measure the changes as things progress, and especially as the project comes to an end in 2024, ideally with the communities owning and sustaining the changes they've made in local health, wealth, and happiness. Esther is also so cool, she added at the end parentheses, if you need more about me, former tech analyst, angel investor, and backup cosmonaut trained in Star City, Russia, all of which is true. Um, thank you, Esther, for being here. Um, uh, next, we have Kay Makishi. Uh, Kay is an entrepreneur, advisor, and mentor who serves as a principal at KEM Growth, a growth marketing consultancy. Sample projects include strategy and execution for a Fortune 10 company, an online advertising company's U.S. market expansion strategy, and a venture capital-backed health tech startup's go-to-market strategy and execution. Kay is also a co-founder of Every Irene, an international community to elevate women and their allies in Japan. She's a delegate of Nexus Global, a community of impact investors and social entrepreneurs, and a U.S.-Japan Council's Emerging Leader Program alumna. Welcome, Kay. Uh, next is Mario. Um, uh, Mario Vaselsku. How do I say your last name, Mario? We, know, we talk all the time. I don't even know. Vasilescu. 
It, well, that's the last school. You're just Mario. You'd be shocked. Yeah, no phone call to our no. home growing up was ever correct. All so right. Don't worry. All right. So Mario. Mar Mario is a robotics engineer uh, turned humane technologist, and he's the CEO of Readocracy, which is a piece of tech that can tell if you actually paid attention to something you read and how intensely. It uses this to recognize and reward people for the content they consume and to show their commitment and credibility on a subject. Um, next is Silka. Silka is not here. Okay. Uh, next is Angeline uh, Gregussen. Uh, Angeline, Angeline is a writer, filmmaker, and artist, and the co-founder and director of Happy Family Night Market, an annual festival that celebrates the Asian diaspora through food, art, and education. Uh, Angeline is currently in the process of transitioning Happy Family into a community-owned and run cooperative enterprise. Um, we also have Claudia Ganella. Claudia is a marketing and communications director at GRESB, an investor-led initiative that assesses and benchmarks ESG performance of real assets, providing standardized and validated data to capital markets. Prior to this, Claudia was director of marketing and business development for Coldwell Banker in Nicaragua and Belize. She worked at KPMG as a senior manager and holds a master's degree in environmental technology. Um, Lakshmi. Uh, Lakshmi is part of the Teach for India program and is currently at the Oxford Said School. I didn't get a full bio from you, Lakshmi, but that's what I have. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, and, then, and then finally, um, we have Seth Killian. Uh, Seth, hi. Uh, Seth is a game designer, best known for his work in fighting games, including Street Fighter. He co-founded Fighting Games' largest community event, Evo, and grew it from 64 kids in an arcade to 15,000 in-person competitors today. Uh, prior to the games industry, he was an academic philosopher before being drafted out of teaching by Capcom to revive the Street Fighter franchise. That is a movie on its own. He's worked at Capcom, Sony, PlayStation, Radiant. He's very interested in systemic value and measuring questions around topics like game health and balance. And finally, we have Zach First. Zach is the executive director of the Drucker Institute, a foundation based on the work of the writer and management guru, Peter Drucker. Under Zach's leadership, the Drucker Institute created the annual management top 250 ranking in the Wall Street Journal, which comes out this weekend of the 250 best companies in the world. Um, uh, the S&P Drucker Institute corporate effectiveness portfolio and a bunch of other things too, I've been reading a long time. Um, and finally, uh, I am Yancey Strickler. I'm the founder of the Bento Society, which is a collective project to redefine what the world sees as valuable and its self-interest. I'm also the co-founder and former CEO of Kickstarter. And this roundtable is a part of the Bento Society's work uh, to explore the frontiers of value and self-interest. So I sent out five questions. The first question was to talk about good examples of measurement. Uh, I said, what are standout experiences you've had when measurement was particularly useful or enlightening? Um, I weirdly think this might be one of the harder questions to answer, uh, but I'd love to start by, by turning to, to Claudia. Uh, Claudia, what have you seen in your experience in the world of ESG? Yeah, thank you, Yancy, and great to be here. And, um, and I'm here really to learn. Um, you know, I think I've got quite a lot to say about measurement, but I'm, I, I kind of want to learn more uh, because I'm, you know, working for an ESG benchmark that, um, you know, has an ability to uh, influence the, cal the capital allocation decisions of um, a large uh, number of, of institutional investors and, and financial investors. So th these are really important questions to me. So um, I'll give it a stab at kind of answering this. Um, and then, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here to, to kind of learn more. So um, very briefly, GRESB is an ESG benchmark. We were established by pension funds and um, we, uh, the, the pension funds wanted to know whether their managers were looking after ESG risks. Um, and so a collective reporting effort has started. The benchmark now covers 5.3 trillion in, um, in, in real estate and infrastructure um, investment value. And, um, and the data is used um, for, for capital allocation decisions. So, and, and GRESB has been going for 10 years. So, so if I kind of look back on, you know, what I think is working well um, and what measurements I think work well within that context, um, they're kind of two criteria. One, 
that there's a kind of objective reality that is being measured um, and that there's a kind of consensus, that there's a process around coming to that consensus um, um, between different stakeholders. So there's a governance piece that's important, but, but, but the, 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 the objective reality thing is that the, the stakeholders have, have agreed that this is something that they can agree on, that there's an objective thing here that they all agree about. So for example, carbon emissions. There's a kind of a sense that um, you know carbon emissions, if you know if they if they get out of control, will have a detrimental effect on the climate. Um, so it's worth measuring carbon. So that's objective. That's that's number one. The second, the good measurements drive action. They're things that enable some kind of possibility to to, to happen. Um, and so it's the kind of action that breathes life into the measurement. Um, so in the carbon case. You know, there's now a bunch of, of, of huge innovation in, in, in collecting data around energy and, and, and GHG emissions. You know, now in sort of at, at meter level in buildings, that's now being aggregated up through increasingly kind of integrated technology chains up to the portfolio level, also up to national and global levels. But, but just at the level of the portfolio level, it then provides a comparable benchmark so that an investor can compare their um, their managers in a, in a, in a standardized way and, and start an engagement. You know, you're not doing well, you're doing better. I'm going to allocate capital accordingly. So Can I ask to, one follow Yeah, one follow-up. How, when it create, to create that consensus, you know, that multi-stakeholder consensus, how long does that take how, and how does that happen? Right. Um, it, it takes a, quite a long time and you, you're, you're kind of, you're, this is public now, but this is kind of, you know, I, I don't think you need to edit this out, but we've, we've gone through a, a long internal discussion about what kind of ownership um, we need. And what's very clear is that we need now an independent uh, uh, governance uh, foundation that owns the standard, that actually owns um, the, the standards against which we will uh, benchmark performance. So from the last 10 years, it's been a very kind of widespread kind of inclusive process, but hasn't been as independent as it should be. So now we're separating, se setting up a separate legal entity to govern this whole thing. So much more to say on governance, but that piece is, is, is really important. Anyone else? Anyone else in this question of, you know, measurement providing help or, you know, providing clarity of direction? Yeah, see, I'll raise my hand for um, the question of objective reality. So I, I just okay. I'll put in a vote for that. And then, um, yeah, let's talk about objective reality. Right. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll try to keep it quick. I mean, what Claudia said, I think was really resonated with me. Our experience at the Drucker Institute has been, we are basically humanists and philosophers in the world of management who um, in an effort to make these timeless Drucker management principles uh, more relevant today have quantified them and produced you know, a, a list and a stock index and a series of things. Um, and what is so uh, kind of fascinating to me on this question of objective reality is you'd be very hard pressed to find a senior executive today who doesn't believe that management matters um, maybe more than almost anything else to the performance of their organization. Um, you find the best, the wealthiest and best connected investors always want to spend time with management teams to try to understand sort of in an intimate, maybe behind the curtain way, how organizations are managed. Um, and yet when we've quantified this system and we've demonstrated its economic value to investors and its editorial and journalistic value through the journal, I'd say the large majority of questions and challenges that we get are kind of basically rooted in the, the fundamental doubt about our ability to manage, to measure management. Mm -hmm. And so we have this reality where sort of everybody knows it matters and we've planted a stake and we can demonstrate statistically, right? We can explain through a pretty amazing model that is sort of based on these incredible principles and phenomenally effective, about 44% of a company's management performance, which in our view is pretty great, right? And it also leaves 56% unexplained, which is not unusual in social science. And yet, rather than being able to have a kind of nuanced and interesting conversation around that, we get a lot of pushback that what we measure is quote unquote intangible, to which I'd say, you know, it's the financials that for most employees and customers are the real abstraction. Um, 
And what's tangible is your corporate culture, your management systems, your relationship mm -hmm. with your colleagues and your customers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that objective reality question really spoke to me. Thank, thanks, Zach. Esther, did you want to add something to this from a, a different direction? Yeah, I sort of thought it would be interesting to, to go slightly meta. And right. so I have three very brief stories. One, when I was five and my brother was three, we both had the chicken pox. And he ran, or actually kind of loped around the house moaning and crying. And my parents were both scientists as context. And I counted the spots on my face and somehow distanced myself from the disease by analyzing it. And so I was much happier. Mm -hmm. uh, second story, mm -hmm. when I was growing up, I, I was fascinated by numbers. My mother was a mathematician and I was always very conscious of how old I was and what grade I was in and so forth. And then as I got into business, um, I found the perfect measure for my happiness. And it was my, the size of my inbox at the end of the day. And I still record that. Uh, and, you know, it's like when, when you talk about something other than an objective single measure, it can often be really hard to find a single number that works, but that is mine. Uh, and then the third story is when the quantified self movement came along, as you can imagine, I was thrilled. And I, I have five sleep monitors, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and right now I'm testing a thing you stick on your forehead that actually measures your sleep waves and it gives you scientifically validated deep REM light sleep. And I thought, great, you know, now I've got this objective standard. And what I realized was that actually, you know, deep sleep is a recognized scientific standard. It's defined, but it still doesn't actually give you it's like the more you know and the more data you collect, the more you realize you really need that single, did I sleep well? It includes your heart rate, it includes the temperature. And so in general, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Yeah, that's wonderful, Esther. And that speaks to what Claudia was saying too about a, a measurement giving some direction, some sense of what to do with it. Uh, those, those are beautiful. Uh, Kay, Kay, maybe one more on this one. This Sure, so I'll give two examples as well. One is personal and just being able to quantify uh, my priorities and also feelings and do sort of my own personal retros at the end of the day to be able to move the needle in my personal goals. And personal I encompass sort of professional and personal in one. Um, and the second was sort of before I got into the startup world and corporate innovation, um, I was a fellow for various kind of projects and think tanks. And um, for one conference, we were at the United Nations in Geneva and also towards sort of had like an inside look into world, the World Bank and various projects that they were working on. And it was interesting to see also how they quantified international global risk and all the data points and the formula that kind of went into sort of this, you know, nice clean report that is uh, published to the public. Um, and so, you know, that, that could get into a rabbit hole as well. Um, but I just, you know, just to kind of throw that out there as two examples. Great, Th thank you. Um, Mario, did you want to add something here or yeah? Yeah, just uh, really quickly touching on um, Esther's point and Zach's point. Uh, the thing that comes to mind for me uh, when we're talking about meta or also getting people to uh, appreciate what we're measuring is the user experience and design of measurement. So I always think of gamification, uh, but then also how data is presented because in my experience, uh, you know, this question of uh, moments where it was uh, enchanting or engaging or change, like when I think of games growing up, caring about scores or, or, or when it became social and making me check in somewhere. Like to me, these were ways where things started being measured and tallied up. And why did I care? It had no actual value. Um, and then the other example I think of is on our last product where we had a dashboard um, measuring engagement uh, for publishers and media companies it was so interesting to see how something could change from when you presented it as a regular dashboard to when you just turn it into just English, like plain, simple English that was written in a way that was really friendly and engaging. Mm -hmm. And suddenly they all cared and they they like, they knew what was there. Um, and so that's always just kind of stuck out to me. Mm. 
Yeah, no, le legibility is a great, uh, legibility and collection, great, great points that I'm sure we'll come back to. Um, so the second question I put in front of us are about failed attempts at measurement, uh, either your personal experiences or, uh, or, one, or ones you know about. Um, and, you know, and I think we could interpret this as like tried to measure something and it wasn't real or it was brutal even trying to do that or, you know, whichever direction you might want to go. Um, Esther, do you want to start us off here? You, in an email, you bragged you had some great failures to share. So <laughs> let's, yes. let's, let's hear well, them. Th this one may end up, I hope, being successful, but it's sort of a story about all the, a brief story about all the issues. So there's a group of people I met at the uh, Arizona State University who basically they're wastewater epidemiologists and they can measure opioids in wastewater, you know, basically what people flush down the toilet and they can distinguish between opioids that have been used and metabolized and opioids that have been thrown away without being used. And you, know, you, can, you can measure the sewage pipe out of one house, which would be very expensive. You can measure you know, an entire wastewater plant in, in some large pipe and I work in these five communities, they all have drug problems and it just, you know, it's amazing. Like it's apolitical, it's accurate over time. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not so much the absolute number, but the change. So is our, you know, our opioid prescription reduction program working? You think it is, and then you discover that people are using more street drugs that aren't recorded. Mm. So, we talk, I talked about this to the five communities and here are the problems. The people who are interested in health and healthcare and frankly, the people we knew, they don't know the people in the waterworks. And you know, it's, it's like the political, the people who need the measurement need to know the people who do mm. the measurement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Three years later, suddenly wastewater measurement for COVID-19 is a huge thing and it's getting funded, the HHS is doing projects and so forth and so on. So I'm hoping that this failure to get anybody interested, I now have a call next week with the epidemiologist in Lake County. And uh, so the thing is to get them to take the COVID-19 infrastructure, that silver lining and put opioids on top of it. Mm -hmm. then, th thank you, Esther, thank you. Uh, Seth, I wonder if you have uh, anything you can think about in terms of some some fails at try, trying to do this kind of thing. Yeah, certainly there are um, <laughs> dramatic fails, and I'm almost brought back to the first question uh, because in the games industry, despite being entirely digital and having an enormous amount of access to very complex human behaviors, there's a lot of questions um, about whether any of it's real or or matters, sort of from the traditional. So the, the idea is that the systems are so complex in terms of human behavior and interactions or whatever else that they can't really be understood or measured by uh, conventional measures. So it's sort of an uphill fight uh, in many ways led by mobile games, which have a slightly restricted space of action compared to a console or PC kind of experience. Um, measurement is crushing there, right? Like the, the, the industry is dominated by measurement. Uh, and I think the future there is becoming quite clear. It's just a question of these sort of layered, how we understand things that we actually care about in terms of human behavior. Um, and we've seen sort of bad and unhealthy tethers between human behavior and spending, which is obviously something that's important to the people who are tracking. Um, but what is sort of long-term health? Look, you can think of that as a, a sugar high or something like this, these other kind of unhealthy, unsustainable behaviors. What does a healthy kind of player engagement look like? Uh, and the answers are sort of remarkably unsurprising from people that have spent time around other people with, you know, spending time with your friends is, is really good. Some variety of experience is, is really good. These kind of very obvious trends, but that are only now coming clear on the point. So the fails are, <laughs> um, the most boring one is actually a little bit further outside the industry. And there's probably someone in this room who knows more about it than me, but uh, Twitch became uh, a popular way to watch video games and developed a lot of uh, viewership, um, which was also sort of an implicit ranking of the games and, and viewer interests uh, because it showed, you know, of course, the viewers at any given moment. So it was very legible and they were sort of stacked ranked next to each other. 
And this has spawned uh, a decade long progressive ecosystem of view botting uh, and, and things that, you know, in some cases it's clearly like a view bot farm where it's obvious that there's no one, no one watching this. These are just IP addresses that are connecting somehow. Uh, in others, the concept starts to sort of shift into a more complicated form um, where it's an embed that's on a web page. So maybe you go to the front page of a popular website and the, the show is playing there. Is that a viewer? Like so in the so in the absence so in the absence um, uh, of more more minute metrics or more finely tuned metrics is then like time spent time spent is that just become what it all sort of rolls up to and that's basically what people think about in some regard but even that's understood to not be healthy at the edges right there's nobody who will stand up and say like they don't want that because it correlated highly with a huge financial success and the opportunity to go again, et cetera. But yeah, you're exactly right. Like, and it's, it's not healthy. And so these kind of understandings about what long-term health looks like uh, are very nascent. And there's a lot of uphill battle about whether this is even a, a viable approach. So uh, well, let's, let's interesting for a purely digital. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's come, let's come back to trying to make an argument for a, val a valid approach. I think that's important. Lakshmi, I wonder if you have any thoughts about um, bad measurement or, or, or anything to share. Uh, a little bit of context. I thought I wouldn't have a lot to add to this table because honestly, uh, the reason that I wanted to be a part of this was because I have had more failed measurements, I guess. Uh, so I could give you an example of what I was thinking. Uh, so again, context, I work with Teach for India and we have a selection team and we have applications coming in. We are an under-resourced organization, so we try to measure, hey, how many applicants are we expecting so that we can prepare uh, interviewers, um, reviewers, right? And um, I think I'm, I'm doing this for the 13th time, and I still get it wrong every time. Uh, and the reason that it is a failed measurement is because uh, we predicted based on historical selectivities of certain demographics. And that itself in my head is a little bit of an ethical question to say, um, I am judging you before I'm even looking at your application to say that, you know, people from this demographic has this selectivity historically. Uh, but we're also taking efforts to say our recruiters will support certain demographics which show up. People who don't show up, we're also supporting them. People who generally have uh, a low selectivity, we support them. So we are working against our own measurements in that way because we are taking efforts against. Um, but I think now what we've started doing is, okay, we'll predict and then we'll fail. Uh, and then we'll measure what's the difference. Mm -hmm. And that would tell us what kind of applicants are we getting? Like, are we getting more people from the portfolios that we've historically had lesser selectivity in? Which means that training team needs to take that into consideration while training them when, when we've selected them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's become the goal of our measurement right now. So we've sort of shifted goals there. Mm. I, think, I think that's a great point because you're talking about measurement that's relative to your own past. Which is a very different way of thinking about this, but I think I think that is a great a great thing to call out. Um, I'd like I, to add to yeah, that. Yeah, Angeline, please. I'm sorry. I um. I. Okay, I'm an artist, so I'm not uh, tasked with measuring large groups of people, like large demographics. I measure myself, um, so I can only speak from my personal experience in doing so, and I am. I have been obsessed with measuring, let's say, my own productivity, et cetera, how I spend my time, you know, did I get enough exercise? Did I get how much deep or REM sleep did I get last night? I have a Fitbit, et cetera. I've done a thing called a life tracker where I track how I spend every minute of my day. And I think, I don't know that there is such a thing as a failure of measurement because what I've found is that every time I decide to measure something, um, what that process reveals to me ultimately are my values. Like, why am I measuring this thing? You know, what I'm tracking change over time. What am I measuring and why? What do I anticipate the outcome of this measurement will be? And I feel like measurement is really just the first step in a process of understanding because I think as Mario said earlier, I think it was Mario, um, you know, what, what is really valuable is like our analysis of that data, our interpretation and like how we derive meaning from this. And so like for me as a filmmaker, as a writer, like the narrative that I construct from that measurement 
from that metric is always is like the most insightful that's the that's the the thing and so for, i'll give you an example when i was doing this life tracking thing and i was tracking like every minute of every day how many minutes was i going on a walk versus sleeping versus answering emails etc and I, I i realized that i was spending a hell of a lot of time cooking and I was like, shit, I spend way too much time cooking. Like I spend like half of my day every day cooking. I need to, no wonder I'm not getting anywhere with my work and with my projects because I, I'm such a slacker. And then I just realized I will, I love cooking. And that's really, at the end of the day, that's what this measurement uh, process taught me is that I really do value this activity so much that I'm spending so much time doing it. And that, yeah, so, Anyway, that what you could see that as a failed measurement, but I don't think the the act of measuring could ever be considered a failure because it just leads to to knowledge. That that was great, Angeline. And I I want I want to come back to this from a question of like what to measure as an artist later. You know, applying okay. measurement to art I think is super interesting. Um, Silka, you just joined. Um, yes. Uh, it, Apologies Silka is for being late. Yeah, uh, Silka is part of our inner ring. Sil Silka is a, a VP of Emerging Design at Adobe and works on AI related products. And um, so I, I wonder what you think about sort of hearing this conversation as you're stepping in about the challenges of measurement or bad measurement. So uh, I'm going to just reflect on my role and what we measure. And there's there's a Typical way to measure a product, and I'm sure there's plenty of you. I have sorry, I don't, I haven't been able to meet you all before. Um, so the the I may be telling you stuff you already know, but in a typical product design, you think about the year ahead, and then you break it down into quarters. And at the end of the day, what gets measured as success is really what is your growth, and it's usually either user growth or return ROI um, and then those figures are determined ahead of time at the beginning of the year or beginning of each quarter they get adjusted and that's what you aim to achieve and if you achieve it you're considered a hero right and but there's also constant discussion about what are we, who are we doing it for I mean the work with lots of designers inherently really care about people so the, the amount of stuff they do in their spare time and also they bring into the organization on, we really want to care about these designers. We really want to care about this part of society. And they put a lot of effort, um, but at the end of the day, this is where there's a disconnect. And this is where I mean, one reason why I started reading and why um, lots of books and now met Yancey and really love how you were talking about measurement. Um, where is this, how do we connect these values that we inherently have, we want to have in our products to actually what gets measured at the end of the day, which ultimately is everybody's motivation to be if we're really honest with ourselves. Um, so I'm not likely the only one that thinks about this. So I've just, um, just starting to meet with um, a, a department which is putting actual people on this to understand it. So we've got a research team that is looking into what are we measuring? Does it really equal success? Let's have a look at other measurements. Does that also equal success? And you, we know the answer, of course, it's going to also equal success determining other things like longer term values, thinking about supporting a community, the loyalty that that brings, which also brings um, income. I mean, we do also need to consider <laughs> making money, it, it, but we, it shouldn't be the only choice. It should be like balanced and thought about on multiple values. And yeah. I so, that, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's very, I mean, I think that's very well said and especially thinking about what the goal of measurement is, right? Like we're trying mm -hmm. to understand behavior. Exactly. We're trying to honor it, maybe adjust it, maybe just like not mess with it, you know? Um, and, and so that connects to the next question. It's something Claudia brought up at the very beginning too, which is about 
how do we know that the things that we're measuring are real? How do we know that we're not just doing some bullshit? Um, you know, Claudia mentioned at the beginning, an important thing is about multi-stakeholders, different, you know, private, public. Um, and I, I wonder if we could talk a bit about that and, uh, and, and, you know, other things related to this. Claudia, do you, do you want to start us off here? Do you, do you have thoughts? Yeah, uh, I'll start, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely start off, but really interested in exploring because I, I'll, I'll keep this within the sort of ESG benchmarking world because there's a lot to say kind of outside of that. And, you know, my concern generally is that measurement overreaches a little bit and uh, sort of we've got so good at certain types of measurement like optimization, efficiency metrics, things we can measure, we've got really good at it, um, that um, sometimes we're just a little bit obsessed with all of that and we don't match it with a territory. It's a kind of map and territory mismatch, which, which you know, I, which, which I think there's a lot of bullshit in there. Uh, and especially if you set up a metric as if it's measuring something else. Um, and, you know, for example, in, in, in my world, you know, often people uh, talk about ESG metrics as also measuring sustainability and they don't. Um, and this, you know, because sustainability is a much more complicated thing. Um, and you can't just look at a, this map of static ESG and uh, apply it to a, a kind of a territory of complex evolving interconnected everything um, to do with sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, and even sustainability isn't measuring everything that we're interested mm -hmm. in. So we're sitting here optimizing this when we're not really dealing with the territory. And I think there's a lot of bullshit. In maybe between. language language is part of maybe what's happening there, right? Because you're saying the sustainability, you are measuring something. Is that actually sustainability is maybe what is under contention? I, can, yeah, I'm wondering, you know, you're, you're working with internally, you know, you're consulting with companies, you're maybe seeing companies own internal metrics. You know, one thing I'm interested in and, uh, and, and Silka brought up is like everyone has their own, a lot of people have their own bespoke ways of doing things. Um, but is, how can we gain ground by making connections or seeing how, so what, what do you see working with both large and small companies with, with how they're using things they're measuring? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I echo Claudia. I'm here to really learn as well. Would love to keep connected with these folks because that's actually sort of one of my tasks right now is uh, we're literally creating a data analytics dashboard right now. And that's sort of one of my responsibilities is how we are. Um, I come from like a large scale advertising background. So it is more on sort of the CTR, the typical, right? CTR, CPC, like all these different advertising metrics. Um, that said, you know, I, I love what I'm doing because it's, it's actually bringing in more sustainable products uh, into the US market. And that's one of our objectives. And that's something that I think about a lot as well is how can we expand the scope of typical, you know, advertising analytics to encompass more of these, you know, sustainable metrics that will make our society a lot better, right? And also, when it, when it comes to, um, I believe Seth is is, is yeah we're talking about time spent on the screen, and you know, I think about a lot of that as well, like bounce rate, right? How can we start evolving the variables that we are measuring so it's not just, um, and also the advertising messaging, right? A lot advertising in the past was very like fear-based or lack-based. And so how can we shift it into how are we empowering people through our products? Um, you know, that's sustainably, environmentally sustainable, but also personally, emotionally as well. Mm -hmm. um, something that I, I think is about. Yeah. Hey, hey Auntie. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. Um, I just want to quickly add for folks, um, and, and I'd be really interested to hear other people's responses on this. Um, one of the, I love the idea of measurement bullshit. There's a whole field of academic study actually around organizational bullshit. There's some great, great papers on it. And um, one of the ways in which I think we find both for the measurement system we've developed around corporate management and the work we do with corporations is that I think um, the most damaging and also hardest to see source of bullshit in measurement is the time span across which phenomena are measured. And I think, I think this touches on a number of the other things folks have mentioned, which is that we have a desire organizationally to measure things in ever shorter time spans in order to be able to respond in ever more instantaneous ways. And I think the important phenomena we are trying to measure are often inherently slow moving. And so, you know, we update our scores at the Drucker Institute annually, and that's about as fast as we think it makes sense to update scores for large corporations and how they manage themselves. 
one of the most frequent questions we get is, has you ever considered doing a quarterly update, something that conforms a bit more with the financial reporting schedule? We refuse to do it. And some of the least valid data sources we've tested are the ones that are based on real-time sentiment analysis. They just don't really relate to anything. Mm -hmm. But there's such a hunger and a desire to measure in every, these sort of infinitesimally small time slices it generates a tremendous amount of bullshit because we end up actually measuring the wrong things in an effort to be fast. Um, and I suspect that touches on a lot of things. Yeah, that's, that's great, Zach. And I'd love to redirect that to, uh, to Brandon. Brandon, are you comfortable speaking? Brandon is the uh, CEO of a company called CrowdTangle, which uh, is part of Facebook and analyzes live social media data. Um, and I, I'm wondering, you know, we've talked before, Brandon, about especially how you get like consensus around a data point or like, how do you know if something's BS or not, whether you decide to track something. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, yeah. And uh, touche on the segue, we measure things in real time, instantaneous fashion um, <laughs> and uh, frequently have really bad analysis that comes from it. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, listen, I think I've been, deep on social media metrics for about eight years. And like, you know, the, the, both from the outside and from the inside. And I, and I think that everything I've had heard so far in this, like very much like ladders up to what feels like has been my experience in that space. Um, and so where I've come down to on the, these days um, is that the more, when it comes to metrics and w what's measurable and what's not and what is good and bad and all that stuff, it's just the more transparency around all this stuff, the better, uh, including on the development of the metrics themselves. And so it, from my perspective around this stuff, as somebody who also used to be a community organizer and very much came from a world of like, uh, of trying to build a, more, a healthier democracy, um, I, I think a lot of these questions in the social media space are only gonna be answered through collaboration between private companies, the outside world, experts, civil society organizations, governments, et cetera. Uh, and one of the only ways you can do that is through transparency. Um, and so that in all these spaces, acknowledging the metrics are never gonna be perfect, that they're gonna be biased in a million different ways. They're gonna be fundamentally based on values more than anything. They're gonna be subject to good and bad analysis. Just create, trying to create like a marketplace of debate around both the metrics and the analysis feels to me like one of the more concrete things that I, I think feels like uh, will help. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I thank, know, I got these thank you. I, I wonder, Seth, is there, is there any kind of consensus happening towards game health? I mean, you mentioned that it's something you're interested in. I mean, you are the designer of the most popular product in the world. Like how, how, <laughs> how, how do you think about this? Do people talk about it? Uh, it's it's definitely a, a controversial concept um, because every plank that you propose about what constitutes game health is controversial, apart from money, right? Like that tends to be pretty easy to uh, align upon. Um, but even that is complicated. Uh, different different places have their own approach to it. But I guess some themes I just wanted to call out really quickly was just sort of the the multiplicity of viewpoints uh, in an attempt to measure. Right? You get higher quality data. Um, how do you do that? Spend more time and energy doing those kind of evaluations. So if we're talking about, you know, in measuring our own discussion here, right? Like if we want to, if we want to measure, like get a really high quality metric, it's going to take us a long time to do that. We have to coordinate with a lot of different people and potential viewpoints. Um, so I guess I just want to call out the cost of getting that high quality metric mm -hmm. or a cost there. So you're never out of the balancing act of like trying to choose where the right spot is. Um, so <laughs> I think this is sometimes a mistake that people who are in charge of measuring, which sounds like this really amazing range in this, in this room, which is super cool. Um, yeah, you, there's, there's no real way to win, right? You talk about building a consensus. And so it's really just choose, choose the kind of measuring. I talk a lot about balances, like choose the place you want to be at to try and answer the question. But that requires kind of a two-sided view of it. Like what is the right question and what is the right measurement to get quickly to the heart of that? Mm. And that's just hard. Uh, and I think often comes from uh, experience and things like that. So that's a deflationary answer, I guess, in some way. Like, you know, it's acceptable, it's acceptable. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. think that there's, it makes me think about like, uh, Esther will turn to you in just a second. It just, it just makes me think like, I wonder what the history is of say, 
calories going on food labels, right? And like, what is the, there's, you know, that has to be a multi-decade process maybe to get to that, but like maybe that is the kind of thing perhaps to think about. Yeah, I, I'd love at some point to talk about this whole undis, you know, unexpected consequences of measuring calories versus measuring carbs and blah, blah, blah. But, let's, let's talk about uh, that. Yeah, please. Yeah. Well, it's, it's being- Or maybe it's too, too much of a side thing. Go to your original point. Yeah, I, I want to go just back to the advertising thing. The, the way advertising fundamentally works, I was on the board of an advertising company. You know, you, you measure, initially you just measured subscribers or you measured viewers and then you measured time viewing and you measured click through, but the, they're all really proxies for, I spend X on advertising, how much does it increase the amount of stuff I sell? And that's a very broad measure. And so the second thing is specificity. Should I go after men 24 to 38? Should I go after people who already bought something at Speedo and I can compete with them? And you know what you what businesses are focusing on again is increase in revenues. What's the return on investment? And so all these things are just proxies. And it's kind of useful to in healthcare, I want to hire all these advertising people because they understand this concept of attribution. He saw three ads and then he finally bought the thing. How much did the first ad versus the second versus the third? In the same way, this person used three different trackers and then he finally began to eat right, sleep more, whatever. And you're, you're focused on the outcomes, but so much, here, here's the bullshit part. I get pitches all the time for the number of people who did X and had such and such an outcome, but it never says of a hundred people that you approached, how many bothered to try your app? How many bothered to use it? Did you get rid of all the people who stopped using it after four weeks? And, you know, so the really important thing is to understand not just what you're measuring, but what you're measuring it in and can you actually get to that audience or do you spend $500 mm -hmm. getting the 10 people who are actually going to use your product? Mm. I like, I like this. I like Kate, Kate comments using attribution models for positive change. That's a nice, that's a nice thought. Um, so I'd love to shift into, uh, and Nicole has brought up some great uh, comments in the chat about the limits of measurement. And Nicole has brought up, well, you know, could we measure love? Like that seems wrong. To me, the question of measuring art and artistic output uh, is one that's super interesting. And, and I would love to hear Angeline's thoughts on that. Um, but yeah, what are, are there areas where we really do think like it shouldn't go there? And, and are all those, are those all things that we should challenge? Like does, does the tender algorithm challenge our belief that you know, love can't be measured or, or whatever? But where do people land on things that you know, seem off or touchier. Angeline, do you want to start? No? Okay. Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, you know, something I struggle with every day. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I feel like my expertise or my perspective here is in qualitative measurement not uh, not quantitative um although i do tr like in vain try to quantify um at least specific aspects of my work but um i'm just going to give an anecdote here so i'm speaking in specifics so i um i did this i did this like strategic planning exercise actually okay so you remember my obituary that I read on Wednesday? Um, I was in a meeting with Yancey on, on Wednesday. I was part of the 12 week bento group program. And as part of my like presentation, I read my obituary that I'd written four years ago as part of this like professional development exercise for artists. And the whole point of this workbook was to get you to develop like a long term strategic plan for yourself in alignment with your mission and values as an artist. And, you know, I set my like one year, five year, 10 year lifetime goals, et cetera. And this is a way for me to measure my progress as an artist over time, like the, to, to track the progress of my career, the quality of my work, 
opportunities, et cetera. And after I, I set my one year goals, you know, X, Y, and Z, and they were all like external validations, like different outcomes that I was um, tar targeting as an artist, like winning certain awards, screening a film at certain festivals, whatever. And I, after a year of working toward these outcomes, like measuring my progress towards these specific outcomes, this metric, I realized that, well, the metric was, was wrong. Like the metric did not, even if I had achieved those goals, uh, that didn't put me any closer to like my, this desired outcome that I had. Um, sorry, I'm getting distracted by all the chats. <laughs> I'm trying to just closing the window, um, which is to say I was obsessing over like quantifying my success, um, all of these external factors that really didn't um, speak to like my quality of life and quality of work. And I realized at, at, after, after a year of, of measuring that, you know, I wanted to shift focus uh, towards more internal uh, measures, like deepening my relationships with people closest to me, for example, and, and, and using that as a measure of the quality of my work as an artist and as, as a human. And that's not something that, that can be externalized or made visible to anyone outside of myself. Mm -hmm. I thank, thank you, Angelina. Silka, we've, we've spoken about this a bit before. You've mentioned challenges of you were trying to talk to other designers about longer term thinking, longer term measurement. And um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we are transitioning into a phase where we're bringing in more analytics into our products and we are changing some of the business models I can't go into. But um, essentially what we now have is a lot more information that we can use to measure success. Um, but it's not being thought of that. It's still being thought of as how much revenue and growth we can have. Um, just in parallel to this, um, I had a team doing some research on what are some of the issues currently in our world. Let's study some of them. Um, why has things gone wrong in what we've built before? And we as in the whole industry. And one thing we focused on was this study on communication. And we realized that most of the communication that we are using is really encouraging short-term relationships, like in, out, um, but constant and constant dopamine hits. And then when we did this research, we realized there's some mechanics that could be added or removed that would increase the depth of a relationship in the way that you communicate. And it became actually pretty significantly pretty easy to actually get to the understanding of that. Um, and I can share with you some design framework we had. If anyone's interested, please reach out. But there's definitely ways we can change the design that affects the depth of relationships you have with people. There's also ways that you can measure, not just on how much time spent, or maybe not even, like even remove that, but on things the amount of things that you share or the times that you are socializing um, can indicate different things. So if there is an indicator of success that might say, we've increased the depth of relationships with this percentage of people, and this is a product goal, then that is a helpful thing, I think. Mm. Um, mm. And that's just one example of things I'm thinking about. And we're just in this current discussion, and I'm really looking to learn how we can do a better job of measuring with now the new tools we're bringing in, yeah. um, our products. And I have to say, I'm not on the marketing side, I'm on the product or the creative tooling, but we have a massive marketing area that with a lot of analytic tools that we're not using. Um, and they could be used for us anything like they're a tool mm. so why mm. can't we be using them in other ways so i'm kind of learning and talking and we're all um planning these changes in yeah that's 
that's that's great to learn. And, and I feel like I've heard a similar thing here a few times, which is we're, we have more data, we're using it to basically still get to how do we grow? How yeah. do we grow revenue? How do yeah. we grow influence? Uh, a belief, a belief and an interest in, there's a lot more interesting stuff than that <laughs> and more valuable stuff than that that we could learn, but a lack of language uh, and a lack of firm, you know, equations, formulas uh, to use to, to like actually close that gap, right? There's, there's a gap between intention and, and, and reality, yeah. um, at least for some of these things. Yeah. One, mm, sorry. Oh, I was, I was going to say, I was going to ask uh, Lakshmi, you know, one of the ways that data gets into trouble as you bring up is when we're like not aware of what all data points are going in or what or who it's avoiding, what things it's not aware of. Do you want to speak to that just, just for a moment, Lakshmi? I think it's more relative to the previous question that you asked, I guess. Uh, but I could just share a little bit about it. Like, I do think when Angeline shared about, you know, uh, how she spent uh, time on cooking, I think if we had to collect data for like 10 people and say, okay, a lot of people spend a lot of time on cooking, uh, when there's a pre selection criteria to say that I actually picked people who like cooking and I'm not aware of that, um, and then the conclusion that I derived doesn't make a lot of sense, I think that's the kind of uh, you know, systemic bias that I was talking about to say um, we do source a certain kind of people and then we measure their selectivity and then their performance, forgetting that we did source them at the first place. And like, you know, uh, something did happen at the beginning and we might have had uh, something else to contribute to the table. What kind of training did we provide and things like that? So that's sort of what I was thinking about. Uh, but to limit itself, I think as long as we're clear about the outcomes and as long as we're open to conversation and people know that we're tracking, I am fairly liberal to say that everything can be measured. Yeah, Th thank you, thank you. Maybe maybe one more, Seth. Do you have anything on this question of like limits? Um, you know, you 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 are in a data rich environment, uh, but yet, yeah. What 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 do you see? Uh, yeah, I think people have hit on this before. It's it's a question of language. It's a question of concept, right? Like language and concept are pretty tightly related. Uh, and then having really a shared vocabulary across those things and a shared understanding. Um, and then finally, I guess the, the thing I was trying to say in a long, longer winded way was um, just making sure that everybody who's involved with measuring understands it's a question of priorities, right? Like if you think about a very simple example of uh, like matchmaking. So you are waiting to play a game. Someone else is waiting to play a game. I need to get you guys together. Very simple question. So the things we think about are like fairness. Okay, we use a ranking of, of player skill. So you're you're a good match with Claudia Yancey, uh, but um, you know how fast do we do we look to find that match? Uh, so we want to balance between like a fast match so you're not waiting around to play and a fair match, and that's about as simple as it gets, right? And those are just straight priorities of like choose, right? Like we all want the most fair match in a reasonable time. And then so all you got to do is sort of poke very quickly below the surface of something that's entirely numbers driven and see that there are these concepts that are kind of inescapable about which people might disagree. Like what is a fair range for a match? Mm -hmm. Do I want like one deviation away two? Uh, how long is too long to wait? Is 30 seconds too long? Is it three seconds? And these are kind of inescapable problems. Um, and there's sort of no solution but to be diligent. And I think there were some points made before about independent bodies who kind of work at this do that right and and update at you know whatever the appropriate cadence is some groups and not phenomena move very quickly and you need to update metrics very quickly others don't and i think that's part of my interest in in this group is people trying to extend that because even even the acts of like consumer purchase or something like that hey they spent the money that may be the process of like months long sub behaviors and even like measuring love like love love is like such an ecosystem of like like small acts and large acts and things like that. And I think we get terrified about like trying to measure it because that immediately says you're gonna be optimizing for X, Y, or Z, which is then to, to misunderstand the love ecosystem immediately. So we have good intuitions about this stuff. Uh, we're short on concepts and language and, and really admitting that it's, we have to pick priorities. There's no such thing as, as purely, purely good in all circumstances. Yeah. Love, love as an ecosystem is my favorite Isaac Hayes record for sure. Uh, no, that is. 
That was great. So many, so many well, you know, well, well put things, Seth. I, I, I really appreciate it. I'd love to shift to just our last question, and then we'll open up the floor. Uh, but the last one is just, where is there unexplored potential for data and measurement? And I think we're coming to some of it here with like, there's some stuff, there's some stuff to be defined. Um, but what comes to mind for people when you think of that question of potential? Anyone have an inspiration? Um, really briefly, yeah. the more we measure biases induced by AI, if we're smart, the more we realize they're just, we're measuring our own biases. You know, if, if AI produces this, it must be because we produced it ourselves first. Mm. Mm. That's all. I'm brief. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. So, um, yeah, yeah, territory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a really pedestrian one that I think actually has a lot of power behind it, um, yeah. which is uh, if we flip the telescope around for a moment, instead of thinking about individual behaviors, if we can ask uh, the kinds of questions we ask of consumers every day, but we ask them of very, very large institutions. So one of the measurement problems we've been working on for years is how do we measure customer satisfaction in the B2B space? Um, how do we begin to hold companies like giant energy extraction companies, aircraft manufacturers, how do we hold them accountable for providing satisfaction to their customers in the same way that we do CPG companies? Right now, there's really no good way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's such a pedestrian thing, um, but I think holding our institutions accountable in the same way for kind of their humanity and ability to relate to who they serve is important. Is anybody, is anybody going to stand here for the blockchain? What's up, Mario? <laughs> uh, I, not on blockchain, although I can do something. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. What are you going to say? Yeah. Please, Mario. Uh, no, just, uh, just that um, I'd be really excited and obviously, you know, biased in terms of what we're doing, but I'd love to see a lot more measurement around uh, information pollution. Uh, and when we talk about media ecology, there's, we, we measure a lot for advertising, but um, you know, in terms of the information ecosystem and the amount of noise and impact on us, I'd love to see more measurement on that. Hey Mario, another great phrase for you. Um, Doris Drucker, who was Peter Drucker's uh, longtime thought partner in all things, she called it information obesity. Love it. I'm just going to add one thing in here, which is so obvious from the sustainability ESG space, which is something that, Yancy, you've spoken about and, and written about, and, you know, is, is an idea that's 100 years old, which is to, you know, put some externalities into pricing of the markets, because otherwise we're just propping up a system that, that, that yes. isn't measuring the important stuff. So it's, it's almost not for lack of ideas. You know, do you, do but, you see any momentum there? I mean, who, so if we were to say, hey, they're, they're, we want greater coordination. We want we want uh, independent validation. You know what? Can anyone say like, well, this? You know, here are ways to do that. Here are people, or here's a model to think of. Is there anything you you think of, Claudia? I mean, I, I would say that you know, that there's a slight optimism that's kind of growing in 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 the kind of responsible investment field that you know, despite the you know kind of horrificness of of COVID, it has accelerated the future so fast. That they are some real, you know, some of the great and the good, some of the big establishments, you know, from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the WEF, a whole bunch of, you know, even, even, you know, well, the FT is talking about this properly and, you know, uh, you know, a whole bunch of the great and the good and, and lots of institutional man, uh, investment funds and, and stuff are, are coming sort of round to this idea slowly. So, um, I, was, I started off thinking I could give a positive yes to the, the to the um, to to well, your challenge there. It's starting yes. here. I think it's maybe maybe it's it's starting now. Maybe that's. I think it might be starting now. Maybe it's starting now. I I would love. Um, does anyone else have an unexplored uh, topic they'd like to bring up here? Or, sorry, unexplored potential. I think um, a brand. I, yeah, Brandon and then Silka. Yeah, I, and then Kay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think one other way to like think about this stuff is that it's not um there's not necessarily black and white that there are spectrums of quality of metrics and measurements and so it might not be that something can't be measured uh but that maybe uh we just have to be honest and humble about how close we get to actually capturing it and i think in some cases like what, what we've also seen is like overconfidence in a lot of other metrics uh and so there's almost like more of a conversation to be had about like just the the you know the ongoing sense of like how close these things are getting to what we we want them to be anyway uh and in some cases we're only getting ones that are like a small fraction 
And in other cases, it might be times we feel like we can get really close. Mm -hmm. yeah, so can yeah. I just put Thanks. one really small thing in here? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, which is, I, I also think there is this, this danger of overconfidence and overreach, I think is a really important one. Because I think as soon as you measure something, um, and, you know, something that's real, like love, we spoke about love, as soon as you measure something, you're sort of implying a science and objectivity around that. You're almost implying that there's a goal-driven activity that you can, you can do in order to kind of achieve it, and then therefore you can measure it. And I worry that that undermines the whole idea of what it is. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a good kind of epistemology, a good way of feeling into all of those amazing things. Um, you know, you can still talk about sort of talk about it you can you can you can uh, you know feel subjectively everything about it and everything meaningful about it and so uh, i think there is a slight overreach and a slight obsession with measurement that could actually undermine the thing that we're actually ultimately interested in so you know a bit of i think humility on right sizing and putting measurement to use where it's good and kind of leaving the rest um you know not driving the meaning out of the rest of life and everything that's so just wonderful. That's what, yes, yes. That needed to be said. It needed to be said. Thank you. Maybe S Silka and then Kay, and I think Angeline wants to say something. And then I want to open it up a little bit. But Silka, go ahead. I think an unexplored area um, is digital well-being. Right now, it means limiting the time on screen. And that is just one metric. It it's really needs to expand and grow. There's so many other ways we can think about our well-being. Um, People have been sort of mentioning it in different ways in this conversation. Um, so I think that's an area to needs to grow. And I, thinking about that, I think we think about it as we as a company have control over all the metrics. But when you think about digital well-being, and I have two kids, and we talk about their love of video games, and I'm like, enjoy them. I love them too. But do you realize that? you are finding it hard to stop to do your schoolwork. And they're like, I, they understand all the mechanics to get them addicted. And they love that. And I'm like, that's okay, that's fine for a while, but you do, but they also hate the fact that they can't focus on other things. And they're completely aware. They're completely, we think they're not aware. Kids know exactly what is going on. And so if they do understand, why can't they also have a choice of being able to tweak the things to like, okay, now from this period, I'm just going to like learn a skill or this is going to like slow down this addictive mechanic or this is going to mm. increase it. Like, I think there's a shift in that instead of us product owners saying, this is what people we should be measuring, the actual end users are saying, we want to have some agency over that too. I do that's think that's, yeah, no, I, I think that's something that is coming. Um, yeah. That that is going to be a move and will be interesting. Yeah, I, I, that's fascinating. Th th thank you, uh, Kay, and then Angeline. Sure. So, in terms of unexplored potential, um, so love, goodwill, human relationships, and peace. Some woo woo. Um, you know, I just think of my own personal journey when I was serving as chair for a national organization in Japan. And it was a people-to-people -people relationship organization investing in human capital. I think there's a lot of potential there um, where this program was on the verge of being cut. And so I tried to quantify, right, with like volunteer hours and how much charity raised these foreign professionals were um, derived, you know, outside of their work. And uh, that's sort of why I pivoted into the for-profit space, right? And so even with every Irene, my co-founders, you know, ex Goldman Sachs, and we debated around, you know, how to sort of structure organization. And we're very adamant about this for-profit model and capitalism, because as Esther said, at the end of the day, people just care about sort of that revenue. And so it's being realistic and not sort of saying, no, we're gonna create like this entirely new system, but it's how do we work within the system that we already have, right? The capitalism, how do we shift revenue in a way that kind of um, steers the whole ship in the right direction? I think Angeline, you know, I really, resonate with what you're saying. I think a couple of things that I saw in the chat box too that resonated, I think, with everybody in the group was sort of like using data and in, in measuring your own personal KPIs and your and defining your own goals, defining your own variables. And so society is just made of individuals, right? And so if we break it down and reverse engineer it, I think one key takeaway for me is like, okay, well, how do we sort of on a scale, right, 
have these sort of micro KPIs for everybody. Um, and I really, you know, appreciate Yancy for starting this because I think it really starts like in small groups like this and individ individually. Thanks. Thank you, Kay. Uh, Angeline, and then we're going to open it up to the group. I was just uh, wanted to second what Claudia had said. Uh, I strongly agreed with the notion that in a, you know, you guys know the Schrodinger's cat. Yeah. Is, any, is anyone here not familiar with this? Tell, okay. tell it, tell it, yeah. Oh, well, it sounds like everyone is, but you know, uh, by virtue of observing the thing, you change the thing itself, yeah. right? So, and I do believe that is true, that it's fundamentally true. And um, yeah, as far as the question, what are some unexplored frontiers or in measurement? Um, I think if, if we can empower ourselves as individuals to reimagine our own metrics and just question them um, and, and, and take ownership of, of them instead of conforming to existing metrics, if we each do that individually um, and have and go through that lived experience, then I think we'll we'll be better equipped to work together and collaborate on reimagining collective metrics. Hmm. Wonderful. Thank thank you, Angeline. Uh, so I'd like to open up here for the last fifteen minutes to the outer ring, the rest of the room. Hello, everyone. Uh, and we'd like to start with a question that Steph had about timeframes. Uh, Steph, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's so great to be here. Thank you to everybody and Yancy for organizing. Um, my, my question is, is sort of different pieces and maybe more of a topic, but I'm curious what others think about situations in which we, if we measure at one discrete time point, we get very different results than if we measure over time. Um, and part of my interest comes from the world of education. And so you can imagine I'm sitting in class as a kid and I have a math test and I'm usually great at math. I love math, but today it's the spring and my allergies are really bad and I do a really bad job on the test. That, that isn't like a, a great measure of my ability or interest in math or what's gonna happen to me in the future as a student and as a person. Um, and so there's probably better ways that we can measure my math education over time. So I'm curious what others experience has been in questions like this. And then the second part is sort of when a big system like education needs to change to use more accurate measures that are taken like we've discussed over time, how do we accomplish that change? That is my experience exactly. <laughs> like when I was a kid, uh, I was, uh, I just was horrible at, you know, algebra and calculus. And I even, you know, I failed calculus in college. And then, and then I was forced into a number theory class and I excelled. Like it was, it came so naturally to me. And, and I had gone through my whole young adulthood thinking I'm terrible at math, I'm stupid. But I just I didn't realize that there's a diff there's a fundamental difference between applied and theoretical mathematics and I and I think Lakshmi was touching upon this with you know I hadn't been exposed to a whole other framework or paradigm of mathematics that I didn't you know I ha I I had a natural ab um, ability for so. Um, uh, Anyway, that I relate to that very, very strongly, and it's kind of like these hidden, these hidden questions in, uh, that can be revealed in, through the act of measurement mm. and understanding who is doing the measuring, and again, like what are our biases that I think are very exciting. Zach, you, 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 you yeah, you mentioned something to me about time frames in chat. What, what, what yep. were you thinking about? Yeah. Um, I'll say, um, I think uh, somewhat subversively, the most revolutionary thing to the extent we can be revolutionary with our, our corporate clients who pay us to help them operationalize our data that we do is we simply enforce that they never look at um, time series of less than five years, um, which inside the companies we work in is just like mind boggling for them. They're so accustomed to looking at things that change quarterly or maybe this year over last year's full stop. And so we always show at least five years, preferably up to 10, if we have it on any phenomenon we're talking about for these very large corporations, that alone changes the kinds of questions that people ask and the kinds of things they're trying to solve for before we even get to what the data says. 
Um, and then in your question about large systems change, I mean, it's essentially what we at the Drucker Institute are doing, right? We are capitalists who believe in the power of management, and yet we are wildly dissatisfied with the current state of capitalism and management in many companies. And so our intervention has been to work from within the system, through the Wall Street Journal, through Standard & Poor's, right, through these kind of big institutional partners. Um, and I think this gets back to something Seth was saying, core to our strategy is to begin with the philosophy and the principles, rather than with the metrics, which is a bit backwards from the way things normally go. We get excited about the data. Start with tremendous clarity and transparency about what it is you are trying to solve for philosophically or in terms of your principles, because your measures will always be inadequate. There, nothing will ever be perfect. Then also lean on tremendous transparency around what you're measuring, how you're measuring it, and why you're doing it that way. We try to be so transparent that if you cared to replicate our system on your own without our help, you could do that. Um, it's tremendously important because there's so much that is not clear about metrics these days. Um, and that will then let you, you know, plant a stake in the ground with whatever system it is that you're trying to intervene in, where you won't get bogged down in conversations about methods so much as you will about what it is you're trying to solve for and why. Mm. That's great. Esther, were you about to say something? And then Claudia, I see you're also itching. Yeah. So Esther I mean, first, one, then Claudia. So one problem is this whole issue that Claudia brought up, the externalities. You know, it's like me now. And the people who measure stuff, they usually want the return for themselves. And the challenge is the biggest, longest returns are usually for society. You know, it's like education, public infrastructure, public health, all the things that we're seeing the lack of right now is as we face COVID-19. These, these are not things owned by individual people. They're, you know, they are the externalities that we're now beginning you know, the negative externalities we're seeing the results of. And that's why attribution is so important so that you can, you know, find the right things to change and the right levers to push. And, you know, just explain to people, your taxes will actually go down in the future if you invest now to keep people healthy so they don't end up in jail and you'll have happier employees and you'll have richer customers, but it, and, and that's the real potential. It's actually understanding those feedback loops. Mm -hmm. Cla Claudia? Yeah, it was just a quick question, maybe to Zach and also Brandon, because you both spoke really usefully about the process here. Um, have, you, have you, or do you think it would be worth considering defining what a, me what a metric doesn't measure? Um, you know, so actually this metric doesn't measure all of these things. Um, and actually be explicit about that. Have you had any experience in, in, in that? For sure. Yeah, I think there's huge value in that. And I think it has to do with um, the social consensus around measurements that are necessary to make them effective. And the more you try to prevent that what you present a measurement as a silver bullet, the less credible you're ultimately going to be because nothing is. So I think it's helpful to be really loud and clear about what you think you're measuring and to really stand for something and also clear about what it is you're not measuring. Um, yeah, my piece that's out as part of our journal package will be out online tomorrow, I think mentions that in part. Here are several huge things that came up for the companies we cover over the last year that we didn't measure, that our system will never measure. We can't predict the engineering failure of the 737 MAX. It's too granular for what we do. It quote, should not have happened based on what we saw in Boeing, but it did. Social science is flawed, et cetera. I think it's really important to be clear about those things for credibility in these complex questions. Actually, if you were watching Boeing and you saw the management changes, it was predictable. <laughs> not that specific thing, yeah. but the fact, yeah, the culture changed and that had this tangible financial blah, blah impact. Sure. And to be clear, it's not to say that nobody could predict it. It's to say yeah. that our system didn't based right. on the data we use, which answers certain kinds of questions really well, but can never answer all these questions yeah. well. So your optimal, you know, as a consumer of data would be to talk to me and to Esther and six other people, right, in order to get the full picture. So or Brandon. The five employees that left. <laughs> yeah. Brand, so Brandon, love to hear your thoughts on this. And um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I guess maybe two is, um, you know, again, I can, I can only really just speak from my experience, but we, when we were first getting started, uh, there were a lot of these tools out in the market as social media was first taking off like clout and other things that basically had these metrics that we, we are internally, we just refer to them as like black box metrics where you had, you didn't really have any idea what they were measuring. Um, and 
we tried to go the opposite direction in our work, which was we just based everything. We actually tried to, like, we set a rule on how many derivations we could have of like any math on what we're doing. And basically for the most part, just tried to show concrete things and then do like literally either just a addition or subtraction on them mm -hmm. uh, to try to keep as many biases out of them. So I think like one interesting thing is thinking about just like what are the component pieces of a metric and how much can you limit the actual like you know, black boxing yeah, yeah. on top of it versus just revealing the concrete items underneath. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second one is also thinking about like, like the maturity levels of metrics um, and almost whether there's a, like a, a metric for metrics, but it's like the uh, being able to say like, this is a metric that, you know, we feel very confident in versus one that's like in development or beta or various different things and being transparent about that. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I think really trying to limit the number that are at the top uh, and then introducing more at the bottom and, and maybe, the, you know, they, they can graduate over time if, if they evolve the right way. But. I can see that. I can see what you're saying, Brandon. I think that's a really nice way to conceptualize it. That's, that's, a, power, that's a powerful thought. Um, in, who else has some, um, anyone who hasn't spoken yet, who has something, uh, alive in them that that is just asking to be a part of this conversation. Angie, Susie, Sarah, Nicole, please. Um. I'm just listening and just kind of, I have to admit, overwhelmed by all your, you number geeks, <laughs> <laughs> and metric geeks. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really wondering where we're heading in terms of you know, whatever Angeline said resonated the most with me. And I think it's the right brain kind of people who are like, I don't know what to do with all these numbers. And, you know, like, so knowing that we're going towards more right brain, how do we combine these two worlds with all these number people like you guys and the AI that's definitely there. And then all this new generation that comes in with more creativity and more right brain stuff so that's what gets me curious <laughs> yeah that's a great that's a great question anyone have any reaction to that i've got a really quick one yeah um, the master and the emissary uh you know just because you said right brain and left brain it made me think of the in mcgillchrist book and you know the way that i just as you're speaking was sort of thinking about it that measurement is sort of the the, the, the emissary who thinks sometimes that he or she is the master so it's it's almost putting measurement and all this great thinking in service of this bigger thing that we think is important. That would be the way that I would respond to that. Yeah. Well, in um, some ways, computers are getting more right, right brained because they're becoming more mysterious and complex. Love that. Uh, Steph, Steph. Yeah, Sarah, what quickly came to mind for me was just that there's some things that I'm not interested in measuring and I'm not interested in optimizing. And I have some friends that are really into gadgets and tech and all this stuff. And I am to some degree, but there's plenty of things where I'm just like, I'm sure this could be better. And I don't care because what I really care about, you know, is is other things in life and relationships and, and spending more time sitting in a chair reading a book. Um, and so there's some things I'm just happy to not measure at all. That, that leads to the very last question, which I didn't warn anyone of, but I wanted to ask finally for everyone to share a book recommendation. Um, and, you know, it, it could be directly related to this or tangential to this, but I think probably is a lot of, a lot of uh, curiosity peaked. So we'd just love to open that up as a last, just like things people might want to read to go deeper. And then I'm going to talk about what next steps will be from this. But Esther, do you have an immediate thought of what someone should read? Um, Danny Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. Great. It's probably. Who else? Who else has a recommendation? Mario, you were holding up a book. Can you say it out loud, Mario? Can you, for the viewers at home? Uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman, which prophesied what's happening. He kind of meant it for TV, but it applies even more to the age of the internet. Uh, Lakshmi, do you want to say what you, what you shared in chat? I realize you just wrote it, but... I mentioned Steven Pinker's Enlightenment now because I thought that was most relevant to the last conversation we had. Uh, left brain, right brain. Anyone else? Zach, something? Anything by Edward Tufte. He is uh, fantastic for helping uh, individual people be smarter consumers of data and um, ask better questions of data and data displays created by other people. Mm. 
grabbed that book last night for the first night of Hanukkah. He's got a new book. He's got five of them out. Yep, one just came out last week. These are like semi-religious moments for us Tufty fans when the new book comes out. It's, you know, it's like well, that's awesome. or something. Yeah. So, so as I mentioned, this is the first of these roundtables. Um, this, this conversation, this is, this is not the conclusion of our conversation. This is, this is the end of chapter one. Um, and what happened here is exactly what I hoped would happen, which is that we would create some breadcrumbs in a direction that, you know, just there was some coherence around some things. And I, I feel like that happened today. Um, so I'm going to, you know, transcribe, share, share back first with this group what, we, what we've written here, what, what we discussed. And, um, and then I think we pick this up. We, we keep pulling on this. And maybe we think of this as a starting point for a conversation that maybe becomes more than a conversation eventually. But it's great to be with so many wise and generous minds coming at this from so many different angles. And I think part of what we've realized in this conversation is how important it is to have that kind of heterogeneous uh, lens. And so we'll, we'll like increase that even more uh, for our, our next conversation. But I, I really am just very grateful to everyone for being a part of this. Uh, it's been excellent. Thanks for bringing us together, Yancy. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been really worthwhile. Thank you, Yancy.